Good afternoon, everyone. We're grateful, very grateful that you made space to join us for this critical conversation this afternoon entitled Campaign to Transform Mental Health Crisis Response. As we gather today, communities throughout the state of New York, including New York City, are taking stock of the adverse consequences to people in mental health crisis when they or someone who loves them places a call for assistance. We know that too many people, the majority of them people of color, have been harmed or killed by police who were the first to respond to such calls. We know that this response has too often resulted in involuntary civil commitment, prolonged detention, criminal charges, and lifelong stigma. We know that it's well past time for change in community models for response, but the debate continues regarding the best change model for each community. That's what we're here to unpack and examine with a degree of care that's appropriateness to the seriousness of the topic. My name is Mark Fleedner. I'm director of the program that serves individuals with significant mental illness here at Disability Rights New York. We're acting as one of your two hosts for today's event. I'm sitting at my desk in our Brooklyn office in front of a bright blue wall and a bookcase bearing family photos. I'm a white male with salt and pepper hair. Okay, mostly salt. Um, I'm wearing tan glasses. And yes, I put on a blue shirt and a navy jacket for you all today. Now, DRNY has partnered with our advocacy colleagues at NILPI, the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, in hosting today's event. We decided to partner on this because both organizations have looked at the issue through a critical lens and, frankly, reached the same conclusions, beginning with the premise that police officers need to be replaced as first responders in the vast majority of such calls for assistance. We want to make sure our analysis informs community conversations around this issue and keeps these conversations alive as policymakers are making the critical budgetary decisions that define the scope and nature of community services for people with mental health diagnoses. Now, let me tell you briefly about your two host organizations. NILPI works to achieve equality of opportunity, self-determination, and independence for people with disabilities. NILPI's position on today's topic is that police who are trained to uphold law and order are not suited to deal with individuals experiencing mental health crises. And that NYPD's history of its police killing 19 individuals who are experiencing crisis in the last six years alone is sad testament to that. NILPI's advocacy to replace police officers as first responders on these calls is longstanding. They played a vital role on the CCIT NYC Action Network. They collaborated with CCIT and NAMI NYC and Vocal NY to spearhead an anonymous community surveying initiative, which identified patterns, trends, and shortcomings of the current NYC system and gathered ideas and recommendations from those directly, directly impacted. And then in October 2021, Nilpi released a report entitled Saving Lives, Reducing Trauma, Removing Police from New York City's Mental Health Crisis Response, which documented the survey results. Survey responses underscored that when police are deployed as first responders, individuals experience fear, trauma, and deepening distrust of mental health systems and resources. Nilpi's fight for a non-police response also continues in the courts. After New York's law mandating body-worn cameras went into effect, Nilby brought litigation for public access to the body-worn camera footage from the NYPD. They were successful, gaining access to unredacted footage of the fatal shootings of Miguel Richards and Susan Muller, both of whom were killed by the police in their own homes. Now, for our part, Disability Rights New York is the protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities around the state. We provide legal advocacy for people with all nature of disabilities via direct client services, community outreach and education, and systemic litigation. We're therefore looking at this, at this issue from a statewide perspective, hoping to educate the public and policymakers in communities around the state who are looking at the issue right now, with many of them currently evaluating the impact of pilot programs where non-police teams are partnering with police in response to such situations. Also in 2021, we collaborated with graduate students at John Jay College of Criminal Justice to look at the issue from a historical perspective, noting the cultural dynamics at play, including racial disparities and entrenched stigmatization of people with mental health issues. That work generated a report entitled Systems in Crisis, Identifying Critical Issues in Response to Mental Health Crisis Calls. Uh, we developed a set of guiding principles, excuse me, for use by all communities currently developing alternative models to, to traditional police response. These principles include using a, using a data-driven approach 
to development of alternative response models that acknowledge the particular impact on BIPOC individuals, careful consideration of the method of dispatch, as in, is 911 the answer or actually part of the problem, sustained and joint training of response team members, incorporation of local community-based mental health services, and adopting a presumption against non-confinement. So with that framework for discussion, I'm now eager to turn the conversation over to our esteemed moderator, Cynthia Rodriguez. A little about Cynthia. She's a true investigative reporter who tackles tough issues like this on a regular basis. She currently serves as senior editor at Reveal by the Center for Investigative Reporting. That's a one hour radio show and podcast that airs at over 500 public radio stations nationwide. Prior to that, she served for several years as an investigative reporter at New York Public Radio. She was part of Caught, the fascinating podcast that documented how the problem of mass incarceration starts with the juvenile justice system. Caught received a prestigious 2019 Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Award for outstanding journalism in the public interest. And in 2013, Rodriguez, Cynthia, excuse me, was one of 13 US journalists to be selected as a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan, where her study project was on the intersection of poverty and mental health. Who better to lead our great panelists in this discussion? It's my great honor to turn the floor over to Cynthia. Thank you. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for that introduction and, um, and for all of your introductions setting up this really important panel. Um, thank you also to everybody who's joining, joining us today remotely. Um, you know, I've moderated many panels before um, with elected officials, with the heads of government agencies, with academics, but I feel like this panel is, is very different and I'm, I'm excited to try to lead this conversation because um, we have on this panel today, people who are working on the ground very intimately with New Yorkers um, who are affected by a serious mental illness. And so our panelists today are gonna give very valuable perspectives that are grounded in their experiences with this community grounded with their experiences with the, men, uh, with the public health system and with government agencies. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from my apartment in Jackson Heights, Queens, and um, I live in a noisy street, so hence, I don't know if you just heard that siren. Um, and I also have many noisy birds outside my window, so you might hear both of those things. Um, now with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce um, our panelists. So our first panelist is Kimberly Blair of NAMI New York City. NAMI stands for National Alliance on Mental Illness and the group provides education, support and advocacy to people and families affected by mental illness. Kimberly has a master's in public health from Boston University. She's worked internationally in Iraq, Colombia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. But here in her native New York City, she manages a group of over 150 people that are involved in a grassroots campaign to increase access to mental health care and end the criminalization of people with a mental illness. She's also involved in improving treatment for people with multiple substance use disorders. And she's a member of a coalition called CCIT or Correct Crisis Intervention Today. The Coalition of Organizations believes police are the wrong people to respond when there's a mental health crisis, and they've been pushing for an alternative that we're going to dive deep into today. Next, we have Daniel Donahue. Daniel's worked in the mental health field for the past 25 years, and he currently serves as the Chief Operating Officer at Transitional Services for New York, Inc. The organization provides housing, treatment, education, employment, and peer services to about 5,000 New Yorkers with serious mental illnesses each year. He's also responsible for the creation of a crisis, crisis respite center, which is an alternative to the ER, and also rapid response mobile crisis teams, which is an alternative to a police response. And our final panelist is Peggy Herrera. She's a leader and member of several grassroots organizations that advocate on behalf of people affected by mental illness. The groups include Treatment Not Jail Coalition, Freedom Agenda, Center for Community Alternatives, CCIT NYC, 
And as Peggy wrote in her bio, quote, most importantly, I am the mother of a handsome son who struggles with mental health issues. We are facing a mental health crisis. We must invest in human beings. We cannot continue to incarcerate our way out of public safety, end quote. And with that, um, I'm going to get started. Um, just, I wanna say to the panelists, um, I can see you now all on my screen. And I know it's really hard to have a conversation remotely. Um, Zoom isn't so great at that, but I would really love for us to try to make this as much of a dialogue between all of us and, and a regular conversation as much as possible. So if there's points in the conversation where you feel like you wanna jump in, just kind of raise your hand. I'll do my best to, to um, throw to you. Um, and we'll just, we'll see how it all works out. But um, as Mark has already said in his, his very um, powerful introduction, this is a very important conversation to have. Um, and right now it's, it's top of mind for many New Yorkers, those, especially those trying to get treatment, housing, respite from a mental illness for themselves, for a family member. It's also very important for people in power making big decisions, the Adams administration and elected officials negotiating a budget and, and the list goes on. And right now, serious mental illness is getting talked about a lot within the context of, of public safety. So I wanna just start there, start by addressing a rise in crime in New York City and violence on the subways. There's concern that the city is becoming too dangerous, that trains aren't safe. And the public perceives a connection between violence and people with serious mental illness. The mayor is responding in part uh, by clearing homeless encampments and, and increasing policing. But Daniel, um, you've worked with people with serious mental illness for, for 25 years. What can you tell us about what's actually occurring uh, among people with mental illness versus, versus public perception? Um, I, you know, I think with any conversation about mental health, starting with the stigma aspect is probably the most important part, um, particularly with crisis. I think that perception that the public has that people with mental illness and particularly serious mental illness are dangerous um, sort of fuels our response. Um, and it's unfortunate that the majority of people with mental illness are, are not violent, are not dangerous, um, and they're more likely to be the victim of a crime than the perpetrator of a crime. And it's, it's particularly hard to combat that portion of the stigma because in the media, um, it's a very attractive article or story or feature to talk about the crime that was committed by a person with mental illness. Um, and for every instance mm -hmm. that's out there that supports that, there's hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that live every day with a mental illness who don't embody that stigma. And I can say that in the 25 years that I have been working in the mental health field, I've never felt once endangered in my daily work. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for that response. Um, so while we are here today to talk mostly about the response to a mental health crisis and who should respond when a 911 call comes in, I also want to spend a few moments talking about why people get to the point of crisis in the first place. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oops, I think somebody doesn't have their mute on. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, uh, and so I want to spend some time talking about what's happening in our mental health system today on the ground. And Peggy, I wanted to start with you. You have a son with a serious mental illness. He first started showing symptoms as a young child. What's it been like finding treatment for him? Um, finding it? I haven't found it yet. Um, but their idea of treatment is a counselor once a week that asks him, how was your day? I ask him every day, how, how was his day? And a Band-Aid, which is a pill. You know, you see a psychiatrist once a month, he gives you a prescription and you're off and you're good. And that's not treatment to me. Treatment to me is wraparound services, which is um, mentoring, jobs, making sure his housing is okay, family, 
um, education, um, mentoring, uh, and people with lived experience should be doing the mentoring. Um, and so I still haven't found those services. We are working on getting those services together. Um, I got really educated mostly by NAMI. I used to go online and find a lot of their workshops. And that was so helpful to me because who knew I was gonna be of a, a mother of someone who suffered from mental health. And so I learned so many things, um, how his triggers, how to deal with his triggers, but there's no real services out here. So finding the services, I'm still working on that. And what has been the consequence for your son and, and for you? Well, living in Jamaica, Queens, over policing, there's a whole lot of police. So his behavior is always criminalized. Um, they don't look at a person. Um, they always seem to say like, why did you do that? Instead of asking what happened to you, they need to start asking people what happened and start dealing with the trauma um, that people go through. Okay. And, and you talked about wanting the mentors to be peers. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about what you mean? Well, I just feel that um, as a mother, um, the trauma, someone who's actually gone through trauma and has had lived experience um, can understand and relate to somebody. And when they respond to somebody like that, they can actually deescalate somebody as opposed to somebody. I think Peggy may have frozen on us. So let's, let's, uh, Peggy, we're going to come back to you. Ah, there you are. You left us for a second. I did. I don't know. This lighting here, it's horrible. I'm trying to get into a good space, but. Yeah. That's okay. Your lighting looks fine. Your lighting <laughs> looks fine. So, so uh, go ahead. You, you were saying that for you, you want someone to help your son who's had, who's experienced trauma before. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the program in Oregon and the program, the STAR program. Those programs have no police response and they come with people who have lived experience. They come with hoodies, they come with jeans, and they come ready to um, not react, but to respond, to be there for the person, to de-escalate the person, to come alongside that person. They don't come to criminalize that person. That person feels safe. If someone's coming, they should feel safe. They should never feel like, like they're not safe when someone comes to, to, to them. Thank you, Peggy. Um, Kimberly, would it be accurate to say that you're seeing people coming out of Rikers or exiting psychiatric ERs or hospitals? And if so, um, what do people need when they get discharged? And what do they need when they're back in their communities to stay healthy? And, and what's happening right now? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that uh, question. First, before I begin, I just want to say that my perspective obviously comes from uh, the NAMI NYC, which I work for, but it also comes as a peer myself uh, and a supportive family member of some folks that live with SMI, serious mental illness. So when I speak, I, I speak from that firsthand lived experience, and I, I know for a fact what works and what, what hasn't worked. And we really, truly need investments in the social determinants of health, as well as the primary mental health care structure that can keep uh, crises at bay so that folks don't have those catastrophes that lead to run-ins with the police or lead into hospitalizations and the exacerbation of our hospital system. So specifically when folks are being discharged from the hospitals or even re-entry after uh, the prisons, which we are also part of the closed records campaign. Um, so abolishing them to begin with might be the solution. But uh, we, we really see a need for increased supportive housing. Uh, when we say supportive housing, we're talking about with wraparound care services. If you do not invest in people being able to live independently or be able to live in uh, an environment that's safe for their mental health after experiencing such a trauma of being in crisis uh, at the hospital setting or post uh, being incarcerated, then we truly have an issue where we're not investing in people and we have the rise of street homelessness, uh, folks in the shelter, our shelter systems do not have enough caseworkers, do not have social workers, do not have mental health professionals. So to be 
through this new subway safety plan evicting folks from the subways and then not giving them an alternative uh, to live and, and thrive and work on their mental health, we're just seeing a movement of crises. In addition to supportive housing, you know, we need to be seeing an increase in workforce uh, development, specifically with BIPOC professionals. I myself, uh, still to this day, doesn't matter what borough I live in, I go all the way to Brooklyn to my provider who is a woman of color, who is queer and makes me feel seen. And the fact that I have to travel like two boroughs away just to keep maintain that level of care is a privilege in itself, but it is a, it's noticeable of the shortage and the lack of mental health professionals we have, especially now since the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also don't have enough alternatives to the psych ER. So I mentioned before that our psych ERs are exacerbated. We've had a short of a bed of beds in the psych ER before COVID-19, but it's been just worse since COVID-19 when those beds were removed uh, for the COVID patients. But we, you know, not everybody has to go to the ER. We have crisis respite centers, but we don't have enough of them. You know, our city really needs to be investing in community-based organizations like Community Access, like the organization that Daniel Donahue works for that operate these crisis respite centers that are peer-led, uh, they're home-like environments that you can go when you're in crisis and maybe you're not to the level of T, like a tier one crisis, but you, you are almost there. You need an alternative because you don't want to go to the hospital because you've been traumatized there. And, and those places really work to de-escalate, to get you back on your feet, to see what it is that you need in order to go back home. Um, and we don't have enough of those in every, and we don't have, we don't have enough of those in every borough and we don't even have one, I believe in Staten Island. So these are the things that we really need to be investing in supportive housing, uh, supported employment, increase in BIPOC professionals and alternatives to the psyche ER. Thank you, Kimberly. Daniel, do you want to talk a little bit about a respite center? And, and before you do that, though, Kimberly talked about um, psych ERs um, being understaffed and, and being um, needing to be able to see people quickly. What's the what's the consequence of, of waiting in an ER for hours or days? Um, you know, I, th I think the consequence is that um, People, you know, we we started the psych the respite centers and the um, the lead team, which is our rapid response um, crisis intervention team, because many people are taken to the ER unnecessarily, and they don't really receive any treatment. So the consequence of being in an ER, particularly when it comes to someone who's taken in for an emotional crisis or a psychiatric crisis, is you go to the ER, you're taken there you sit, you wait, you talk to a social worker and you're released and you really don't get too much treatment in an emergency room. And that's the unavoidable, the avoidable emergency room visit. And that's why the respite centers were brought online and, and our lead team was brought online to avoid those trips to the emergency room. Um, so the respite center is a 24 hour open door um, respite center, which was developed as an alternative to the emergency room. So you can picture anybody who normally would go to an emergency room can go to a respite center. And one of the great things about a respite center is it is peer led and it's completely staffed by peers. Our director is a peer, our assistant director is a peer. Um, and it's a much different level of support that somebody gets um, from somebody who has the peer background and the peer training because there is a, a, a mutual support that goes on. And the conversation is not about um, I, I guess they're they're more of a, a valued informant when they're giving information because they've been there before, they know some things that have worked for them and and they can give more valued advice. But it's an open door respite so people can come and go. There's not much disruption in your life as far as work or school or having um, your interactions in the community with family and friends, which you don't typically get in an inpatient setting. In an inpatient setting, you're brought to the inpatient setting, you're not allowed to come and go freely like you are in a respite. So people can get the same level of support, but still continue their lives as normal. 
And Daniel, how do you measure whether, how do you measure success in the respite center? Um, you know, our, our measure of success in the respite center is after people leave. So the, the goal of the respite center is to stabilize, you know, whatever the immediate crisis is that somebody's going through, but give them some tools that they can take with them afterwards to avoid having a crisis again and to develop some skills that they can use to manage future crisis in their natural environment. So in their home, in their apartment, and not necessarily need the respite center. So that might be working with somebody to develop a wrap plan so they have a toolbox of, of coping strategies to deal with future um, crises. It may be helping somebody access more stable and suitable housing. Um, and I should preface it that our respite stay is 28 days. So you can, you can accomplish a lot within that 28 days. Um, so in addition to maybe housing, we can link people with better treatment resources or more permanent treatment resources that fit their needs at the time. So that when they leave, there is some sort of support network that they have that they've been able to start building while they're there. And Peggy, has that ever been an option for you and your son? Um, yes, I've thought of respite, but when you call for help, you gotta call 911. If I had a 988 number or a different number mm -hmm. where I have access to call someone else to show up, it would be better. But when I call, only 911 comes. So I, I just don't call anyone. And, because it feels yeah. too risky for you. Well, when you hear my story, you'll understand that when now when he goes into a crisis, I go sleep in my car because there's no help for us. There's only police and I don't want them to kill my son. So, so tell me, let, let's go there. So tell me what you did, you have called 911 in the past and, and tell us about that experience. Um, we have called 911 several times. So he's already in the system. Um, he usually, they'll come and they take him to Long Island Jewish and there they are. They, they tend to him, they counsel him for the night. They'll even keep him there and then he'll come home. He'll feel a little better, but this time it didn't go this way. They came. Um, and I asked them to not, I said, I'm not going to let you in um, until EMT arrives. As soon as I called, there were like 30 cop cars here. It was like a, a mob. They came like, they mobbed out. And so I said, I'm not going to let you in until EMT is here. So they insisted. They were like, no, we're going to get in. And um, I was standing by my door. Something? What to, in the past, had it also been sort of 30 police yes. officers? Okay. Police always come in huge numbers. They come like you, like when you call and you say, my son is having a crisis. It's like if he committed a crime, like they come like 30 cars in like in less than two minutes. So that's why, you know, the response to other things, I'm like, see, they can come. They just choose not to. So they came that this particular time they came and they, they insisted. I was by my door. I said, I'm waiting for EMT because I know my son doesn't feel safe and I know the stories and they had killed so many people already. So I was so afraid. And so I said, when EMT comes, I'll let them go, I'll let you in. They insisted, I stood by my door and then they kept on and kept on asking. And, um, and I said to them, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, my, so I said to them, I don't wanna let you in until EMT. So when they came, they, they came, they were all in front of my door and I explained to the sergeant that he had no right to break my door. They were gonna break my door. And I was like, you have no right to do that. So we're waiting outside with them. I go to the EMT. This is why I'm not in support of a lot of things. EMT, I go to the, the person in charge and I tell her, listen, they wanna break my door. And she's like, whatever they say. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like you're the EMT, you're trained for this. So not too long after, the they had trucks pull up like if it was like if they were like if it was a drug bust they came running out like big trucks now the block is already blocked off they came with these shields and these tools and they came and the sergeant said to them move her take her down they didn't even give me a chance they didn't ask me to move they took me right down dragged me my son heard them because he wasn't going to open the door because he knew they were out there he opened the door because he heard me screaming. He said, that's my mother. They grabbed him by the neck. They pulled him out and they beat him up. And then they took him. I spent the night in jail. 
And my son never got the help he needed because they took him to a Jamaica hospital where I had originally said, if he goes to a hospital, I do not want him to go to Jamaica. I want him to go to Long Island Jewish. They still took him to, to uh, Jamaica hospital. He was out two minutes later and I was calling him from jail. And I had never been arrested. Well, and, and Peggy, did they charge you with anything? Did they drop charges? And well, how long? They did. I had to fight the case. Um, a lot of us from the advocacy organizations went there. We rallied. We spoke up. They weren't willing to drop it. But then eventually, they, Melinda Katz did drop the charges. But we had to fight for that. But that's ridiculous that I was criminalized for calling for help for my son. That didn't make sense. And, and now it's it's had the effect where, where you don't want to call for help anymore. Is that, is I that am you? traumatized. I even, even just hearing them, wherever I see them, I'm traumatized. Now, knowing that they would do that to me. When I drive, if they pull me over, I'm, I'm not even trying to do anything wrong. But if they pull me over, I already feel it in my heart. I, am, I already got the trauma now. So That's now right. they traumatize me. And Peggy, was there anything that you said in the 911 call that would have prompted that sort of response? No, I, I, it clearly says it. Um, it's on NBC. It clearly says, I want um, ambulance, not the police to show up. I said, I said it to them. My son is having a crisis and I need help. Please do not send the police. Please send the ambulance first. And they still came. They were the first ones to arrive. And he wasn't aggressive. He, he's never aggressive. But even if he were, and you came like that with guns, you're coming to react. You're not coming to, to help him in any way. And that's just the problem. When you come like that, imagine he wasn't aggressive. But had he been aggressive, what were you hoping to accomplish coming here with about 50 cops with guns? How was he, how was he gonna feel safe ever? Mm -mm. And does your son have a fear of, of police officers? Absolutely. Yes, he does. He doesn't feel safe. In fact, afterwards, they, they followed up um, because he had a crisis. They followed up. They came here and they said they had a mobile crisis unit, but they were officers with guns. I said, could you just step out of my house, please? Because my son was already triggered. I was like, how does my son, how is he supposed to feel safe? And you're supposed to be a crisis unit. That doesn't make sense. You don't even understand him. You're a police officer. You don't understand what he's going through. We need peers. If he had somebody at the door that could actually understand him, then he would feel safe. But they came back to try to be his counselors. Mm -mm. Thank you very much for sharing that that story. It it, it sounds very um, like a very scary moment for you and your family. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it really was. Um, Daniel, earlier you mentioned running what's called a lead team. Um, can you explain what that is? Sure. The, the lead team is a it is the alternative to the police and EMS responding to psychiatric crisis or emotional crisis. So between 2017 and 2019, we ran a, a very small and hyper-local rapid response um, crisis program in the Queens Village area in, in Queens, one of the boroughs. And it was a two-person team, one licensed mental health professional and one um, certified peer. And they would respond to crisis calls. So this was part of the DISRIP program, which was money that was invested in changing the way that the, the mental health system worked. And one specific area was how crisis was responded to and, and avoiding the use of emergency departments and inpatient psychiatric units um, with a different resource. And the lead team was one of them. So we had worked with Long Island Jewish Hospital, the 105th precinct, to try to figure out what was the best time to deploy this team? So we had arrived at a time and for seven days a week, we would field this team um, 365 days a year. We weren't tied into the 911 system. So this was all referrals from providers, from community members, from um, the individuals that were in crisis or somebody that knew them. And we had a cell phone and we would respond within five minutes. Um, in the beginning, it was very difficult to get people to trust that this was going to be a, a good resource to respond to uh, a crisis because we, we do have these sort of path dependencies where 
there's a certain way that we've done things and we've responded and people kind of trust in that as the only way. So it's it's hard to break them of that idea that 911 is the, the number to call when somebody has an emotional crisis. But we did finally get ourselves entrenched in the um, in the area. And, and ultimately we were responding to about 1800 calls a year um, in, a, in a very small area. And, and half of our time was actually spent with um, crisis response. So that was the point when somebody decided that they needed somebody to, to come and help them with the crisis. And then the other 50% of the time was with crisis follow-up. So that was more of the um, following up with somebody afterwards, making sure that they had connections to treatment, to the social determinant resources they needed, like food or, um, or um, a, a friendly visitor, something that they might need. Um, which was more important for preventing future crises. So, so we, we really had the understanding that this, this one crisis could be um, addressed, but there needs to be something else afterwards. You can't just have somebody de-escalate and then leave them alone. You, you do need to tend to somebody and you need to provide a gap service until they can develop a permanent network of supports that, that's going to sustain them going forward. Mm -hmm. Gap service meaning just your team visiting them? Yeah, so we could step in for a very time limited period and work with somebody so that they would they would have a support. I mean, I think, um, you know, prior to the pandemic and, and, and now, mental health services are not that easily available, especially if you are a, a somebody who's having a first time experience. So getting, knowing where to go, who to call, what to do, it can take a very long time from the point that you decide that you need some help to the point that you actually get some help. So a service like ours can come in and provide a very time limited support until you establish those linkages and actually get enrolled and, and go through the intake process. And what were what was some of the feedback that you were getting from the hospital, from, from the families you were visiting, from the people themselves? Um, generally, um, it was a very positive response. I mean, I think one of the hallmarks of the success of, of having this type of service in place is the very small number of visits that actually resulted in a visit to the emergency room. So out of, we had about 1800 visits a year we were averaging, and we had less than 5% that actually resulted in a trip to the emergency room. So we kind of know that with the appropriate service in place, crisis can be de-escalated in situ. So in your apartment, in your home, you don't need to leave your home to deal with a mental health crisis. And the, the other benefit too is, even though the respite programs are small and don't meet the need in, in any way in the city, the mobile, the mobile crisis teams do provide an outlet to an alternative to the ED. So somebody can be referred to, taken, and, and enrolled in a respite center um, if they find that they can't manage whatever crisis they're currently having in their natural environment. Okay. And so as you were explaining earlier, this was funded in an effort um, to help hospitals to, to limit the ER visits. Um, was this funding uh, given by, at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level? So the, the funding, they had these performing performance provider systems. So they were led by a hospital and it was a group of providers that, that joined them and the, the money flowed through the PPS. So the PPS picked, it was sort of like a menu of interventions that they were going to pursue. And for the Nassau Queens PPS, the avoidable ED and inpatient utilization was one of the, um, particularly for behavioral health crises, was one of the interventions that they, they picked. So our, our lead team was one of the interventions that they funded. Um, ultimately, we wound up closing the program because we didn't have a sustainable source of funding. At the end of the, the money that came through DISRIP, there was some managed care funding available, but not fee-for-service Medicaid billing. So we just unfortunately weren't able to keep the program running. Okay. And, and the money just ran out and there was no level of government that stepped in to replace it. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Okay. 
Okay. Um, Kimberly, uh, you are part of this coalition, Cro uh, Correct Crisis Intervention, or CCIT. Um, and I understand that um, you, do, so, so there is CCIT, and then there is also something that the Adams administration is, is currently working with, and it's called the Be Heard Pilot Program. Um, this is a pilot that I, I remember a very similar pilot that the de Blasio administration did as well. And it's it's a program, uh, it, it was, I think the de Blasio version was slightly different, but but sort of the same idea. Um, the, the pilot program involves sending EMTs and clinicians to respond to 911 calls. Um, it started in East Harlem, then to Central Harlem, and then to North Harlem, and now I think it's expanding to Washington Heights, Inwood, and a couple of places in the South Bronx. Um, but you feel like CCIT's uh, um, response would be better. Can you make the distinction between uh, CCIT and Be Heard, and 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 talk about what what your vision is? For um, for a response when someone is in a mental health crisis, definitely. Uh, well, first of all, you heard on this panel constant mention of peers, and the reason we uplift peers in the crisis response model is because no one will ever understand what someone is going through in a mental health crisis except for someone who has gone through it themselves, and so this is really where our pilot at CCIT NYC stems from. We did a whole bunch of research series of focus groups within New York City communities. And we the response was overwhelming that people wanted a, a non-police response that was modeled off of the CAHOOTS model in Eugene, Oregon, which has operated for nearly 30 years without one casualty, without one person responding, getting harmed. And it's really the model is they have a peer and then they have an independent EMT worker, which is the same model we would like to adopt at the city level. And the reason we say we want a peer crisis worker um, who has received over 500 hours of training. So it's not just like we're throwing peers to the wolves. We will well, uh, well equip them to be able to respond to the crises uh, and the different diverse communities that he or live here in New York City. But we pair them with, we say we pair them with an independent EMT because in New York City, EMS is highly tied to NYPD is tied to 911 dispatch and they operate hand in hand. So in order to really break free from police response and not continue just perpetrating co-response models where we have peers going out and then the police jointly responding and you know the peers, the police are gonna get there faster, right? You heard from Peggy today, right? They respond faster than any ambulance ever can. Um, if they're called at the same time. And through our model, we would like that to operate with a new 988 number that is gonna go live um, in all 50 states, not just in ours, uh, after July 16th, 2022 of this year. And so we would like for our proposal that has peers come to the forefront, but we've had these conversations with the city advocacy over and over again, and they just, it just falls on deaf ears. We, we, their Be Heard model does not operate 365 days a year, does not operate 24 seven. And I don't know if you know anything about crises, but crises don't operate on a nine to five model. They don't operate on a business model. You can be in mental health crisis at 2 a.m. at 3 a.m. So for a mobile crisis response that is funded by the city to not truly respond in, in the actual hours and the timely fashion that crises actually ensue, then that's why we continue having this problem. 
we keep having a problem where people's needs are not being met. And we would like um, the difference also, and I don't wanna just keep on belaboring the point, but the difference also between the Be Heard model and our model is we want to see the, commu the community-based organizations that know how to do this, that have trained peers, that have peer crisis workers, we wanna see them running the mobile crisis teams. We don't wanna keep seeing the city. Why are they not contracting out to the people who know how to do this, right? Um, they, they started their model and we really would like to have seen another pilot that ran simultaneously maybe and, and show you, show you the evidence that peer response is the best response. And so Kimberly, what, what sorts of pushback do you get um, when, when you're putting forward your ideas? What, what is the biggest obstacle? The biggest obstacle, Cynthia, is that people really are afraid of anything that undermines the medical model. They are, ter and I'm not here to knock down social workers. I'm not here to knock down clinicians. We need them, but we really need them. There's a lack of, I mentioned that primary mental health. We need them to be doing those weekly sessions, those check-ins with Peggy son, with me, with people who need that, that uh, weekly care so that they don't assume the level of a crisis, right? The pushback we receive is people feel uncomfortable with someone who's not a clinician coming out, but we all know that a clinician will be supervising. If a clinician is needed, they, they work behind the scenes. There's easy, it's easy to assess, to get access to a clinician if need be, but why is it working in one city and we don't have the opportunity to show how that works here. People feel afraid of peer crisis workers undermining their authority of, as clinicians and honestly probably running them out of jobs, but that's not gonna happen because there are separate needs. We don't have enough people to respond to the mental health crises. There is a secondary pandemic happening right now. If we don't have enough psychologists, social workers to respond to the long wait list in the city for just a measly appointment, what makes you think we're gonna have enough to respond to a mobile crisis team? Peers, we have an employment issue within our community, right? It, it is hard for some of us to find jobs, but this is something, this is untapped potential that we are not looking into or delving into, and we are not properly, properly use, utilizing peers, which are assets in our community. And the asset that they can bring to the table is helping others in crisis. So, so Kimberly, I wanna ask you how the need has changed since the pandemic. I know that NAMI is a place that many individuals and families go to, as, as Peggy herself said, that's where she went when she was looking for some help. What, what have you, how have you seen things change um, pre-pandemic to, to where we are now? Definitely. We have not only an influx of people calling in for help, but the, the, type, the type of callers that we're receiving are different. So that's really actually um, the true shift within our organization's helpline. And for those who don't know, NAMI NYC operates a helpline. We, it's not a hotline to help people in crisis. It's more so in the aftermath. When you come out of a respite center, you need to be connected to services, right? Um, the type of callers are people experiencing first episode psychosis, people experiencing mental health crisis for the first time and not knowing how to access uh, care or where to go it, because we literally have had a call, calls from, uh, from mothers who self-identified as a black mother, afraid for her black son, given all the tumultuous situations we've had in our world, afraid to call 911 for someone in crisis. And then we had to designate, we had to have given the NYC well number and other things so that, and refer them to actual crisis services, because again, we don't do it. And so the type of people who are calling are people who are touched by mental illness for the first time in their lives. So this pandemic, 
whether or not you have a formally diagnosed mental health condition under that DSM-5, everybody's mental health was impacted. Everybody had experienced anxiousness, periods of negative uh, mental health. And for the first time, more people are getting help. And I would just like to end with, when I spoke before on investments that our city needs need to be working on in order to address this crisis, I forgot to mention the main support that is, is needed is family support. Our organization is the only one that really trains family members on how to help other people in crisis. And we receive little to minimal city funding at all. And so for us to be running this helpline with, with moms calling in, with aunts coming in, care, care, caregivers calling in for courses and classes on how to help their loved one cope for the first time because they have never seen them in this situation, we should be receiving some sort of support from our city and we're not. And I see Peggy has her hand. Yeah, I, I do too. So, so Peggy, um, you, you were, you're shaking your head. Um, why is this resonating with you? Um, like Kimberly so clearly stated, um, I mean, I've done lots of their workshops and they're free. They're all free. Um, and, and they have workshops for my son too. Like if he wanted to go on, and they're free and no one is supporting them in any way. And, you know, no one understands that when my son goes into a crisis, all this, that I, all the work that I do for him to support him, what about me? When he goes into crisis, where's the help for me? Where's a respite center for me? Where's someplace safe for me besides sleeping in my car? Because police now have traumatized me. So now we have the whole family trauma. Now it's just me and my son you know, and we're both traumatized. So it's really, really important that it's peers. It's really, really important. I think me as a mother, watching my son grow up, he was diagnosed as a little boy. I think mental health should be in our schools. They should be teaching it to, our, to all children as part of the curriculum so that it could be normalized so that people won't feel like they're different. My son never wanted to admit that he had, a, that he had mental health issues up until he met other kids and he was like, oh, I'm not the only one, you know? And so I think it should be taught. I think mental health, I think it should be free. It should be accessible to everyone. In fact, even now we're facing a mental health crisis. It, it doesn't discriminate. It, it, anyone can be affected by mental health. And being a mother of a son who struggles with mental health issues, the issues that I have to face, the times that I have to like, you know, stay remain consistent with him and and be that thermometer so that you know he doesn't feel unsafe you know that's hard for me but I have support because I'm an activist because I do advocacy work I know I have supporters but there are mothers out there and and I started to get that as he was as he got older but there are mothers out there who have no support we don't know where to go we don't know what to do I still don't have help so it's either I go sleep in my car or I have to call 911 and we shouldn't have to do that. We need support. We definitely need, need support for resources in our community. There's no way I can go in this community and find any resources for my son. To get an appointment, it's, forget it. You have to wait months. It's a waiting list. And it's not even real services. It's a counselor that might remember him and ask him how his day is going. And you want him to take a pill, but you're not here. There's no engagement. There's no groups. There's no anger management. There's no coping skills. There's nothing. And to get those services is like, you, if you call 911, you're not going to get those services. So it just leaves me just waiting. Until this day, I am still fighting for those services. But they need to invest in mental health and stop investing in police. They need to invest in mental health and stop investing in stadiums. They need to invest in human lives. People don't go in, and Rikers Island is horrible. They need to close it down immediately. People are dying in there. Not only physically, but people are dying mentally. They're dying and people are, they're being left there. They need to close it because people, they say, oh, people are getting their treatment. They're not, they're not getting treatment. They're not getting their medical appointments. They're not getting their medication. And so you get medication and then what? Now you have them, now what? You gotta, I believe in relationship and peers, build relationships with people. If yeah. you don't have a relationship with somebody, you cannot help them. 
I'm Thank big you. on relationship. Thank you for that. Um, certainly, certainly um, Rikers is something that we could have another three hour panel on. Yes. Um, but just to, uh, Kimberly, I see your hand up, but I just want to get to, um, you, you talked Kimberly about how um, one of the biggest obstacles is getting the, the medical system to expand their view of peers and, and what's possible. Um, but there's also, um, there is also in this pilot program, for instance, the Be Heard program, um, they have put statistics up and New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, the group organizing this event, has done an analysis of those statistics. And so when you look at the Be Heard program, 82% um, of calls are still being responded to by police. And um, there have been prior pilot programs in which this has happened as well. Um, and dispatchers, you know, are weighing public safety when they dispatch. And so the question is, are they being too conservative? Um, are they too afraid to, to let go the model of, of police responding? And so, um, you know, one way to know would be to track 911 calls um, and, and to see what the outcomes are. Um, but you could also make the argument that the police showing up um, is, is escalating these interactions. Um, but I actually just wanted to ask, I want you to weigh in Kimberly, but I wanted to ask Daniel real quick, um, in, in the lead team responses, did you ever have to call the police to help? Um, yeah, there were, it's a very small percentage of time that we would actually have to, that the visit resulted in a call to 911. So we're, we're talking out of, out of the 1800, it was only 4% of the visits. So you could do the math, it's, it's very small. Um, but generally, most of the time, people were de-escalating with a little bit of supportive counseling from the peer or the licensed staff member. Um, and I think part of that is that even if it is EMS that's showing up without the police, I think right from the get-go for the person that's in crisis, because many times they might not be the person that's calling, the perception is that you're going to be removed from your, your apartment, from your home. You're not starting off on a very supportive setting where somebody's coming to your door to say, here, I'm here to help you. Let's see what we can do right now, right here. When you see the, the, the uniform response, whether it's police or EMT, that interaction is start, already starting off from a, from a power struggle. So you're, you're already right off the bat, you know, in the hole for resolving something um, in a very supportive way. Um, and we would, we, we, when we did eventually call 911, most of those interactions were taking a long time. So it was after an hour or two hours with somebody in their apartment or in their residence um, where we decided that this wasn't going to be de-escalated in place and they might not have been open to going to a respite center or more than likely one of the beds in a respite center wasn't available because it was at capacity. Um, so it was it was a very rare circumstance where we would have to call 911. And even in those cases, people were prepared at that point that this is what's going to happen. And you had two people there to help manage the situation with the police. So it was actually an easy transfer to go from somebody's home to an emergency department. Kimberly, did you wanna, did you wanna jump in now? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, could you just repeat the, the latter portion of your question? Yeah, yeah the, the earlier point I was making was that there's also, um, a tendency within, you know, nine one one dispatchers mm. and and um, the NYPD as well um, to 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 not want to risk something happening, and so therefore a lot of calls just in these pilot programs get channeled to um, to the nine one one system can, instead of these yeah. alternatives. I can definitely speak to that. So one of the first issues and one of the main advocacy points that we've done as CCIT NYC, as NAMI NYC, as all these folks in coalition is that to run any sort of pilot like this, 
you, is, and this is embedded in our CCIT proposal, you need to narrowly define the points at which the police might be necessary, where a public health emergency could turn into a public safety emergency. The issue now is that we conflate the two, right? With the subway safety plan, we're conflating street homelessness, which is a public health crisis. We're conflating mental health crises with public safety because of the given events. The few less than 1% that we see on the TV of crimes that might have commit that might have some attributions to someone who has a mental health condition. By the way, those people tried to get care multiple times and were denied as well by our system. Okay. On average, the first thing is on average, people who experience mental health conditions, and this is a, a statistic, you can look it up from HHS, from whomever, people with mental health conditions are 10 times more likely to be the victims of crimes versus the perpetrators, okay? So if you do not narrowly define what time, at what points, what constitutes a public safety emergency, and you're going in with not that statistic that I just mentioned, but with the idea that people with mental health conditions are criminals by nature, which is a lie, then you're gonna think anything could be a threat to your life, especially the police who are ill-equipped, ill-trained for to have empathy, to have the core values that you need when you respond to someone in crisis. And so a scissor, unfortunately, is not, is not a weapon. Uh, it could be somebody who is dissociating and in crisis and feels like somebody is coming to attack them and a, a trained person knows how to de-escalate someone with a scissor. Now, someone with a gun, that's different. That's different, you know? These are the nuances that you need to take the direction of someone, and I'm just giving examples. I'm not saying that this is what happens every time, right, when you respond. But these are the things that we need to clearly define what is a public safety emergency when someone is responding to crisis. On top of that, we don't have enough peers as, as being trained as uh, 911 dispatchers. We're, we are training, uh, they said that they're training 911 dispatchers on how to delineate between what's a mental health crisis and what warrants a, po a police response. But if you don't incorporate peers at every level of the model, somebody who's a peer crisis worker who picks up that phone and hopefully will pick up the 988 calls that won't, won't be answered by 911 anymore, but a peer would know. A peer would, by nature, not just through training, but also through lived experience from being a New Yorker also, can know the difference between what is a public safety emergency and what is a mental health crisis. So these are the things that, the issues that, that are with that model. We, there weren't, wasn't enough consultation with community-based organizations. There was not consultation with uh, peers. And, and when they did the trainings with the 911 dispatchers, they, they didn't bring us to the table to say, hey, this is what you need to add to your training so that someone who's picking up that 911 call knows that they don't have to respond with the police, that they can respond in a different manner. And Kimberly, you've talked about CAHOOTS as, as sort of the, the go-to model. Um, this is a program that's out of um, Eugene, Oregon. Um, do you know how they define public safety and, and uh, at what point um, that model uh, would bring in an armed police officer? They have had, I believe, to call the police less than 1% in all the 30 years that they've responded and they adopt a similar understanding of that narrow definition as our CCIT model. So that everything we, we built our proposal upon is from the Eugene, Oregon model, including what constitutes time to call the police, right? Less than 1% of times, remember. But we adopted it to our New York City uh, landscape and also took in the feedback of those people, those very diverse community members that we held focus groups with. And I just want to say that 
Um, we are also a plaintiff, CCIT, as well as NAMI NYC, against the last administration and the NYPD for this EDP policy that is causing all these police officers to respond jointly when there's a mental health crisis. So EDP, for those who don't know on the call, stands for emotionally disturbed person. We don't like that language. It's very stigmatizing as someone who lives with a mental health, with multiple mental health conditions, right? But there's this policy where they treat it like it's terrorism almost. And you could have anywhere to from five to 12 police officers. In Peggy's case, it was like 30. And it's it's not uncommon. It's super common. I know people on this call right now who have been responded to by the police. And I know some of my advocates who one of my advocates, she lives with PTSD and they, they removed her service animal away from her when they responded uh, because the dog was in the way trying to protect the person in crisis, right? And it was seven police officers. And then they restrained her and she, they left her without her service animal, which further escalated the crisis. So not to just, you know, go down a rabbit hole, but I want you to know where this is stemming from. This is deeply rooted in our NYPD policy. And our policy needs to change from that level as well as from the response model in order to start breaking apart the police from the mental health crisis response model. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, Daniel, when you were running the mobile crisis team or the lead response, um, as we've also called it, what, what was your definition for, um, for when an incident was gonna rise to a public safety response? Um, you know, the, the, the lead team was um, <clears throat> a little different than the response for 911. So 911 is an NYPD and EMS is responding to a crisis. If you kind of look at it as an arc, it's at the very top of the arc. So at, at that point, somebody has decided that somebody needs more help than can be mustered around them. Our, our The way that we looked at crisis was that you need to intercept that crisis much lower on the arc at the bottom. And um, like Kimberly said before, crisis doesn't operate on a 24 hour, you know, a, a business day schedule where it's gonna happen from nine to five. But generally crisis doesn't also come out of the blue. So there are some precursors and the, the at the most mildest point, if you can intercept that crisis, you have a much better chance of managing it. And that's where the, the lead team really tried to intercept people who needed some support so that it's a very, you know, a, a very gentle supportive counseling that somebody might need. And they might be in a better position to, to realize that there's some tools that they need to incorporate into their life to, to avoid a, a full-blown crisis. Um, so we never really approached the, the public safety portion of things because um, we weren't really high on that arc. The 911 calls that, that we had to make for the team, there, there was not a single one of them that came from a public safety perspective. Um, it was just concerned about somebody's own safety. So I, I can tell you that we, we, we never encountered a situation where there was a, a fear of, of violence on the part of a person or that they were, they were going to be pursuing that path. Thank you, Daniel. And Peggy, I just saw you turn your camera off, but hopefully you're still there. Um, I just wanted to ask if, um, you know, Daniel and, and Kimberly have both explained that um, someone just doesn't go into a crisis all of a sudden that there there is sort of a, there are signs along the way. Is, is that, have you seen that with your son and ha have you um, learned to be able to tell um, different signs or yes. recognize different signs, I'm sorry. Um because I know him so well, like, I, I feel like I'm so in tune with him now. Um, there was a night, um, he, I was, I was asleep, but I heard some like moaning and screaming in my kitchen. And because of the workshops, I'm going to tell you. Um, so I got up very quietly and I walked into the kitchen very slow. And then I just looked and there was my son and he was gone. And if you could look in his eyes, he wasn't there. Wherever he was, his mind was, he wasn't okay. 
and he had a knife and he was going to commit suicide. He was going to kill himself. He was going to hurt himself. That's for sure. And I knew that I had to tread very lightly. So I just called his name and then he looked at me and then he, it just like, he, it just, he opened his eyes. Like he realized and he just started crying and he dropped the knife. But had I not known, I would not have known how to approach him because I'm, I'm a mom. I'm loving myself. I'm going to run to him, babe, what are you doing? No, he didn't need that. He needed me to understand that he was in a moment and the way I approached him made a big difference. It could have went a whole different way. So, and that was like two o'clock in the morning. There's many nights that they're three in the morning, five in the morning, you know, I don't think I've ever had one during the day besides the one where I got arrested. That was the only one. They're always off hours or in the evening, you know, things happen throughout through their days that trigger them. And we have to know how to respond to those triggers. So that's why you see it's criminalized in our communities, in our neighborhoods, people walking down the street, someone will call 911 because someone, their behavior, and they're really just going through a crisis or they're going through something and they need help. And that's why I'm big on, edu on educating community also, because if you don't educate the community, people think, oh, that person is, and I don't like to use those words, crazy, or they don't, I don't like that. You don't know what someone's going through. So I've seen that many times when my son goes into a crisis and they're off hours. And I think that we need people to respond that can help them. Peggy, thank you for sharing that very personal story. Um, that that uh, must have been a really, really hard night for you and your son. Um, Mark, I want to check in with you real quick to see uh, how we are time-wise and um, if there is uh, anything that um, we'd like to take from the audience at this point. Sure. Um, I think we're about at the point where we spoke as, as a group about, about winding down because we're very uh, respectful of everybody's time and very grateful for the, the tune in. I will say that there's a couple of themes that I keep seeing. Folks are very interested in knowing as much as they can about peer respite centers. Um, things that have been referenced are, is there one in Westchester that I can access in my area? Is there a directory of them around the state? But also one of our colleagues mentioned that, that you know, the limitations of the respite center and that, that it's a specific model and there's only so far you can go with it. So I think everybody here is probably gonna be inclined to wanna learn more about that and what we can do with it. I also have to say that the um, collective supportive energy that I see in this room, both in the conversation and the chats, indicates to me that this is a group of people that would like to be as connected as they possibly can with each other on the issues raised. Um, I just want to remind people to, to you know, jot down the acronyms you've got here. You now know about NILPI, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. You know about DRNY, Disability Rights New York. You know about Daniel's uh, place, T-S-I-N-Y. You know about Kimberly's uh, place, um, you know, NAMI NYC. Um, we're, we're reachable. And we love uh, the input of the folks that are, are not only um, sharing their lived experiences, but turning them into advocacy, like Peggy, who is the, the most perfect example of that that any of us could find. So I'm hoping that as we have this certain these new developments in um, a, a bit of a demonization of folks um, with mental health issues, and that concerns us all, that we, um, find each other and continue to develop these alternatives um, and what we are sure are the right components of them. And, and folks, we have to do this. This is all about where the money comes from. This is where the money comes from. So we have to get to the policymakers and tell them that the investment has got to be made in completely different directions, as Peggy so, so well stated, um, than it is now. Um, so those are my takeaways. And um, I, I, but I don't think it crystallizes to any one question. Um, it's all good stuff. But it, all it means is that folks want to know more and they're incredibly engaged. So that's where we are. Let's, uh, I guess there's one thing, uh, maybe one, one potential question that Daniel could maybe answer. Um, I think you said that um, there was a comment that the respite centers are limited in, in who they can serve and what they can do. Daniel, do you want to address that at all? 
Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the respite centers are very limited. There's, um, there's one in every borough, and then there's, there's a few smaller respite centers that have been built into existing um, congregate living facilities. So they might have one respite unit, two respite units available, but it's generally not to the point of meeting the need. So we, we operate one of the, the, the respite center in Queens, and it's only 10 beds. So that can kind of tell you how, how limited that resource is. And when you consider that it's a 28 day stay, that those beds are only turning over once a month where we're only servicing 120 to 150 people a year if they're staying for the full 28 days. Um, and generally they're, they're pretty successful. Um, it, it is a, a much different setting than an emergency department, uh, much more supportive. And it's a very different type of support that you get um, in a peer setting than you would in a medical model setting. So that, is something that definitely could be expanded. And from a cost perspective, it's much cheaper to see somebody for 28 days in um, a respite center once or twice a year than it is for somebody to go to an emergency department four or five times a year. And Daniel, are respite centers currently covered by Medicaid? Right now, respite centers are covered by Medicaid managed care. At this point, it's not available for individuals that just have fee for right, straight Medicaid. Okay. And is there a place where you can recommend people go to find out, um, find a list of respite centers in the city? Or I think someone mentioned Westchester. Well, I know you can call NYC Well, and they'll hook you up directly with one of the respite centers if you're in need. All right. Thank I you. also... Uh, not to cut in, but I also put some respite centers in Westchester in the chat for whoever is interested. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. All right. Um, we've had a pretty um, vibrant discussion. Thank you. Thank you all for, for joining us remotely. Um, Kimberly and Peggy, I just wanted to ask one, one final question to you. What, what is the next step for CCIT? And, and do you feel like um, uh, government officials are, are hearing your concern and your voice? I think you could better answer that, Kim. Awesome, um, no worries. So Peggy and I already have a longstanding relationship. We know how to work together. Um, <laughs> So basically our next step, I mentioned that EDP lawsuit, we want that policy struck down. It is stigmatizing. We want them to stop even using that language, but let alone treating people with mental health conditions like they're criminals. That's the first thing. We are actually in the process of centering peers within our own organization, within our own coalition so that we can practice what we preach as well. Uh, we are still, still, advocating to city council, mayor, whoever is going to hear it, uh, especially right now, they're in their budget uh, time period. Uh, we're advocating for them to fund our model, to incorporate more peers into, especially as they're expanding Be Heard, they really need to tweak it. They need to tweak it so that they are addressing people's needs in a timely manner and that they are actually properly utilizing community-based assets, including peers, uh, but, but also the community-run centers around them, right? That do, do that continuum of care that we've talked about before, because uh, it's not enough to just respond to someone in crisis alone. We know that in the next days, you can have more crises again, or you can have a relapse, or you can have a number of things. So you need to have those social supports around you. Um, we also are delving into how to how to be more in coalition with other coalitions. We, Peggy and I are both on the Treatment Not Jail uh, Coalition, and that is actually something I'm, I, I believe in our legislative committee, we have been considering uh, amplifying. And for those who don't know, that's a state bill that reduces the barriers for, for people with mental health conditions who have run-ins with the police, for them to access these diversion programs that are, are run through specialty courts. So our specialty courts um, that are covered within the Treatment Not Jail Act or, or the model that we're proposing within the bill that would be the Treatment Not Jail Act um, are drug courts and mental health courts. And up until now, there are so many barriers. People 
honestly, 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 one of the main prerequisites for um, accessing these programs when you have run in with the law is a psyche valve. And people will sit at Rikers for over 351 days, almost a year, waiting for that psyche valve just so that they can be eligible for this program. And so they're sitting in there because they might not have the funding for bail to get out, right? And they're sitting there and they might have come in with, you know, uh, one mental health condition. Let's say you came in when you shoplifted in a, experiencing a manic episode. I'm just giving an example, right? And now you go in there and because of the trauma that you've experienced at Rikers, it's now exacerbated your condition. So now you've elevated or escalated to psychosis or something that's, that, that lingers on with you forever because psychosis in itself, experiencing certain things is a trauma in itself, right? Certain symptoms could be traumatic for someone who's never experienced it before. So we want to be more in coalition with other things that work to decriminalize mental illness uh, across our city with the hopes that we keep chipping away at, at uh, Mayor's Adams subway safety plan. We keep trying to promote peers, peer outreach workers, not just in the subways, but on the streets, in the shelters. Um, and we keep promoting this idea of peer crisis workers as part of the response to mental health crisis calls so that we are now creating a uh, a situation or a landscape that moves towards justice, towards mental health justice, and not towards the criminalization and just victimization of us, because we we're people and we are assets to our community. Where you're one in five people live with a mental health condition, if you didn't know that, and one in five people in New York City live with a mental health condition. So it's me. I'm someone's sister. I'm someone's auntie. I got a lot of nieces and nephews, but it 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 really is anybody. You count on the street, it could be one, two, three, five, that fifth person. Thank you, Kimberly. And I'm gonna give you the last word and, and end um, our panel discussion here. Thank you very much to you and to Daniel and Peggy um, for sharing your experiences here. Um, and thank you again to everybody who joined us remotely.